Then there's a story of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was born and grew up in Chicago. In 1955, when he had just turned 14, he went to Mississippi to visit family there. His mother warned and she schooled him about what he would find in Mississippi, what a young black male like himself should expect, what he must do and not do in order to stay alive. And think about the fact that a mother has to school her child that way just when he goes to visit family. But Emmett Till was full of life and full of fun. One day, while in Money, Mississippi, he made the fatal mistake of whistling at a white woman as he was leaving a store owned by her husband. A few days later, the store owner and his brother-in-law came in the middle of the night with guns and took Emmett Till away. They were seen beating him as they drove him away. His relatives began looking for his body along river banks and under bridges where black folks always look when things like this happen, as his uncle put it. Think about that. Think about what it means where black folks always look when this kind of thing happens. Think about what that tells you about this country. Emmett Till's body was found in a river. He was beaten and shot to death. Beaten so badly he could barely be recognized even by his mother. A 14-year-old boy lynched for what? For whistling at a white woman. In an act of tremendous courage and large-mindedness, his mother, Mamie Till, displayed his body publicly in Chicago, and she refused to have it touched up so that all could see what had been done to him. His body was viewed by tens of thousands of black people in Chicago. The story of what happened to Emmett Till aroused deep anger among black people all over the country. It shocked many white people in many parts of the country, and it became an international news story and outrage. But back in Mississippi, white people rallied to the defense of the men who had kidnapped and brutally murdered Emmett Till. These men were put on trial only because of the outrage around the country and around the world. Death threats and terror against black people in the area where this lynching took place was increased to keep them from saying what they knew and how they felt about this lynching. In a courtroom that was segregated, with white people filling the seats and the few black people who were allowed in forced to stand in the back, the jury of all white men found the murderers of Emmett Till not guilty in an hour. Their lawyers even accused Mamie Till and the NAACP of conspiring to cook up this whole story of a lynching. Actually, Emmett Till was alive in Detroit, these lawyers claimed. Not long after they were acquitted of this crime, the two men sold their story to a national magazine, telling in detail how they brutally murdered Emmett Till. But nothing was ever done to them. Despite a massive campaign calling for the federal government to indict these two men, the government refused. Sound familiar? Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was president of the United States at the time, never even answered a telegram sent to him by Mamie Till. J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, called this brutal lynching of Emmett Till an alleged murder. And he gave much more attention to investigating the involvement of communists in protesting this lynching than he ever did to the lynching itself. But the lynching of Emmett Till became a rallying cry for black people. People stood up who had never stood up before, as Mamie Till put it. In talking about these lynchings, I'm not exaggerating any of this. In fact, I have actually left out some of the most gruesome and disgusting details in talking about these lynchings, because there is only so much of this that you can stand to talk about or to hear about. And these were not the so-called isolated incidents the way they always try to tell us whenever they get caught in one of their brutalities and murders, the way they try to cover up the real crimes of this system and those who rule it. 
Thousands of black people were lynched in those times. And all black people lived with a constant terror of this. Listen to the following statement by the author of a book about lynching. He said, it is doubtful that any black male growing up in the rural South in the period 1900 to 1940 was not traumatized by a fear of being lynched. What is he saying with this? Nothing less than this. No black male growing up in the rural South in that period could be free of that fear. Every black male was haunted and scarred deeply by that fear. Think about what that means. And think about how this touched black people as a whole. A sociologist who studied black life in Mississippi in the 1930s learned how deeply the threat of lynching was in the minds of all black people, from the very young to the very old. And in a PBS program on the system of segregation in the South, which was called the Jim Crow system, they quoted a psychologist who said that every black person living in the South under Jim Crow was living actually under a death sentence. It might or might not actually get carried out, but it was always there. Black people could be killed for anything they did which might offend some white people. And the whites who killed them would never be punished. A black man could be lynched for looking at a white woman in a way that some white people thought was the wrong way. And the whites who killed him, again, would never be punished. Or a grown black man could be killed for not calling a young white boy, sir. Or for not stepping off the sidewalk to make way for white people. Or for any reason. Or no reason at all. And this was related to the overall outrages to which black people were subjected. This experience of lynching and its effect on the masses of black people can in a real sense be taken as representing and concentrating the experience of black people as a whole. Long after literal slavery with all its horrors had been ended in the 1860s.